Hello, listeners. Welcome back to the Climate Ready Podcast. I'm Ingrid Timbo, and I'm joined, as always, by Alex Maroner. To start, we hope that all of you are doing well during these uncertain times. With COVID-19 impacting almost every region of the globe to varying degrees, we should all do what we can to keep ourselves and those around us safe and healthy. A good place to look for the most up-to-date information on the virus is the website of the World Health Organization, which can be found at www.who.int, as well as the Johns Hopkins University Coronavirus Resource Center, which can be found at www.coronavirus.jhu.edu. Now, in today's podcast, we're taking a longer look at another emergency that has dominated news cycles in recent months, the catastrophic bushfires in Australia. Hello, all. Now that the devastating fires have concluded, we're starting to get a more full picture of their impact as well as their underlying causes. Hint, climate change is among them, but not alone. For expert insight and local perspectives, we were lucky enough to chat with two Aussies and friends of the program, Dr. Jamie Pittick and Dr. Emma Carmody. We do cover a lot of ground in the interview, and as such, this episode does run a little bit longer than others. So we'll be leaving out the regular Climate of Hope segment at the end and bringing it back in the next episode. For now, let's listen and learn. Climate Ready is a product of AGWA, the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation, an international members-based NGO working across technical and policy programs to mainstream resilient water resources management, focusing on the connections between water resources and climate adaptation and mitigation. The Climate Ready podcast is made possible with support from Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit, or GIZ, on behalf of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ. For more information on GIZ, visit www.giz.de. Climate Ready would also like to acknowledge the continued support of the Water Global Practice of the World Bank. For more information on the World Bank's activities around water, visit worldbank.org slash water. Today on Climate Ready, we are lucky to be joined by two guests coming to us from Australia. So for longtime listeners, one of them may be a familiar voice because Dr. Emma Carmody was featured in a previous episode talking about transboundary water governance in the Murray-Darling Basin. So Emma works at the Environmental Defender's Office, a community legal center specializing in public interest environmental law. Additionally, Emma serves as a legal advisor for the Secretariat of the Ramsar Convention. Today, we are also pleased to have Dr. Jamie Pittock, who is a professor at the Australian National University. His research focuses on environmental governance, climate change adaptation, energy, and sustainable management of water. Welcome to you both. Thanks, Ingrid. Thank you. Well, both Jamie and Emma have agreed to join us for a conversation around the ongoing bushfires in Australia and all of the implications regarding land management, climate change, public policies, and more. So again, thanks to both of you for being here. And We'll focus predominantly on that topic, but before we start to discuss the recent bushfires, I thought maybe we could start with a little context. In general, I'm wondering, what are some of the most evident impacts of climate change throughout Australia? Well, if I can start, Australia's got one of the most uh, vulnerable geographies in the world for climate change, being in the mid-latitudes. And as climate change strengthens, we're seeing in the tropics uh, some of the monsoon-type systems uh, heading further south, which includes rain, but also severe tropical storms, hurricanes or cyclones. In the south, life is even more difficult because the rain-bearing easterly storm systems, the low-pressure systems, are being pushed further towards Antarctica. And so we're seeing less and less rainfall in southern Australia. So far, uh, Australia's warmed by about 1.1 degrees, and uh, we're already seeing some really extreme impacts. We're seeing increased uh, frequency of severe drought, 
the droughts uh, exacerbate the conditions that provoke fire. And as everybody around the world has seen, we've had extreme fires. Uh, and this is having tremendous negative impacts on a whole range of sectors of society. Uh, our farmers are suffering as they can't grow crops. We're seeing, for example, vineyards that are dependent on particular climatic conditions, having to change grape varieties, uh, move further south, uh, harvest weeks or months earlier than they have in the past. We've seen our tourism sector severely hit this summer due to things like lack of water and fires and smoke. And despite all the thinking that has gone on in Australia around adaptation, you know, this summer has brought some really nasty surprises that we just hadn't thought about. Well, that was a very comprehensive answer. I think to that, I'd simply just add, for example, sea level rise, acidification of oceans and accompanying impacts on uh, marine biodiversity, in particular our Great Barrier Reef. And then, of course, impacts on terrestrial biodiversity, which have already led to observed changes in things like the distribution of species, the timing of many critical life history stages, such as reaching reproductive maturity, plant and animal physiology, gender ratios, uh, ecosystem structure and function, and so on. Well, it <laughs> sounds like there's more than one or two challenges that we could probably spend at least an hour talking about them individually. I definitely want to get to the political context in a little bit. But before we get there, because it has been making worldwide headlines recently, we did want to talk a little bit about the summer bushfires that Australia has been facing. Do we think the worst of the bushfire season is behind you? And of course, at this point, I'm using season in kind of quotation marks because it seems like with climate change, those quote unquote seasons are shifting. Can I be a typical academic and say yes and no? So yes, in that in the past week, there has been some extensive rainfall in southeastern Australia that at least for a number of weeks has doused the worst of the, the fires. No, in that the bushfire season is extending at either end. And so it's starting earlier and it's finishing uh, later. We're talking in mid-February and the fire season could continue into April and that does create issues. And so in the past, one of the key adaptations for both uh, Australia and for North America for fire was that because our fire seasons didn't overlap, Australia could rent uh, things like fire bombing aircraft from Canada and the US. But now that our fire seasons do overlap, it's creating a lot of stress at either end of the fire seasons about, you know, is there enough equipment to do the job? I also say no for another reason, and that is that the end of the fires isn't the end of the crisis. And so the fires will have an impact that lasts for decades. In the short term, in coming weeks and months, the risk is that heavy rainfall washes ash and a lot of eroded material into the waterways and that uh, deoxygenates the water so kills many of the surviving aquatic fauna, clogs up domestic urban water supply systems uh, and so it's going to take a long time, uh, months, to get to a point where we've got a clean water supply again. The other longer term impact is that eucalypt forests when they're burnt and regrow, the young growing trees transpire a lot more water than the mature trees, and that will diminish uh, stream inflows. And so we could see a significant reduction of water availability, surface water availability, for anything up to 80 or 100 years. And that's really quite dire because the mountains that burnt are the key water catchments for southeastern Australia, and many of these rivers are already over-allocated. So losing even 10 or 20% of stream inflows really has quite dire consequences for the whole social ecological system. I just add the legal and policy dimensions. So first I should preface it by saying that Australia is a large continent and peak bushfire activity varies across the country depending on seasonal weather patterns. So Perhaps it's most effective to illustrate with a case study of New South Wales, which is in southeastern Australia. It's the most popular state and it's the state where we've had probably the worst bushfire activity in the country. 
We actually have, under the relevant legislation in New South Wales, a statutory bushfire period. It's called the bushfire danger period, which normally runs from the 1st of October to the 31st of March, basically from mid-spring to the beginning of autumn. So it's the inverse, obviously, of the Northern Hemisphere. So there's discretion under the legislation to vary this bushfire danger period. And in fact, this year, the government announced that the bushfire danger period would commence on the 1st of August. From a statutory point of view, a legal point of view, it started a full two months earlier than it ordinarily would under those provisions. Aside from climate change, what else is maybe contributing to the uncharacteristically extreme events of this year, be it public policy or or land use management or maybe a loss of traditional ecological practices? I would say that climate change is the primary reason why we're having such severe conditions this year. One of Australia's favourite poets described the country as a a land of drought and flooding rains, referring to the extreme swings that we can get from season to season and year to year. But what various academic colleagues, what the volunteer firefighters on the ground are saying is that what we're seeing this time is unprecedented in terms of the uh, extent the area of of forest and other lands burnt in terms of the severity of the fires, the fire behaviour. With this hotter weather and changing climate, uh, the fires are getting so hot, for example, that they're creating their own thunderstorms that then have lightning, which starts new fires. We're also seeing types of forests rainforests, for example, that are fire sensitive, that that don't burn, that historically have been a biological fire break in the landscape because they are so moist and have this microclimate that resists fire. We're seeing those dry out and burn. And so this is, is really unprecedented. And I think I'd just add that it will probably take time for scientists to determine the extent to which climate change influence the current drought and the associated bushfires. But I think it's important to note that the bushfires were preceded by the hottest and driest conditions in Australia's history. So we have been experiencing record-breaking drought conditions across southeastern and southwestern as well, Australia, for the last 18 months to two years. We have seen records broken, for example, in relation to temperatures, rainfall or lack thereof, inflows, root zone, soil moisture and so on. And our National Bureau of Meteorology has indicated that these conditions do indeed deviate from historic norms and to that extent are at least partially attributable to climate change. When you think about all of all of these very complex and interlinked changes that are happening across landscapes and in these river basins, I was wondering the role that land and water management policies have played in all of this. Some significant work was done by two groups of eminent scientists in relation to the Darling River following the infamous fish kills, which occurred about a year ago. Essentially, what they found in both instances was that overextraction has played a role in the current state, the woeful state of the Darling River. So in terms of water management policies, that's something that needs to be urgently addressed, particularly in the Northern Basin. But more generally, the policy settings, the government hasn't shown any appetite to change those, to return more water to the environment, to address what's been identified as ongoing issues with over-extraction, which have contributed to the state of the Darling. One of the key river systems, the Murray and Darling, the key management plan that was prepared for that runs from 2012 through to 2026, hasn't directly made any provision for dealing with climate changes. At the time the plan was prepared, they said that the plan had a degree of inbuilt adaptation in that Australia's water allocation system is largely based on a share of the available resource rather than this wacky Western United States prior appropriation (laughs) rule. But um, even so, if the water availability is diminishing due to climate change over periods of years, 
then there needs to be a way of readjusting what society's values are for that water. So if the same share is allocated to the environment as it is for consumptive use, the risk is that there's not enough water in the environment to meet key thresholds to sustain particular wetlands or particular flora or fauna species that society values. And so our governments have failed to build into these key management documents that ability to adjust to climate change other than waiting to the scheduled review leading up to 2026. It's also worth noting that though we have federal laws, principally the Federal Water Act and under that the now famous Murray-Darling Basin Plan, state governments are still responsible to a large extent for water management of most storages at the state level, so public storage dams. Now, there are a number number of public storage dams that are managed on the basis of worst possible inflows up to 2004. So a policy decision, quite a deliberate policy decision, was made in relation to some of those dams to excise data from the millennium drought and certainly to ignore climate modelling regarding likely future worst case scenarios. The material point I'm making in terms of policy settings pertaining to water and climate change is that you've got policy settings in regulated river systems relating to storage dams which are based on data that is 15 years old. How that can continue in the circumstances is really beyond me. It is just, I'm afraid to say, it is borderline negligent. Going back just to touch on the relationship between, you know, how climate change is maybe impacting or exacerbating the bushfires that you all had. What do either of you find to be maybe the biggest misconception about fire behavior and management, specifically in relation to climate change or the impacts of climate change? Well, there have been some public figures, including elected officials, who've been very keen to downplay the role that climate change has played in the current bushfire crisis. And they tend to focus on things like the fact that a percentage of fires have been deliberately lit by arsonists. Now, that is an almost annual occurrence. Every year you will find fires are accidentally or deliberately lit by people. You'll also find instances where they're lit by virtue of lightning strikes. However, that's the trigger. Um, That certainly can't account for the extent or the intensity of these fires. And just to give you, I mean, to give you some raw statistics, as of January 2020, and this is based on some stats that I was looking at last night, the fires had burnt approximately 11 million hectares. Now, you can, you compare that to the California wildfires. They burnt approximately 800,000 hectares. And then the, the, the 2019 Amazon rainforest wildfires, they burnt somewhere in the vicinity of 900,000 hectares. So, you, you know, you geographically, you're talking about an absolutely enormous area, yeah. uh, the size of, Euro, you know, some European countries. And New South Wales, so that's southeastern Australia, the most populous state, Sydney is the capital, to give people an idea of where that's located. That has experienced the longest continuously burning bushfire complex in history during this bushfire season. So, you know, certainly in some instances, fires have been accidentally or deliberately lit, but that can't, that cannot explain the extent and the intensity of these fires. That can really only be explained by the fact that they were preceded by the hottest and driest conditions in Australia's history, effectively. Another misconception is that before British occupation, that all of Australia was patch burnt is a bit of a misconception. And also that the fires have been exacerbated by lack of fuel reduction, of control burning and other ways of Mm. uh, reducing fuels in the landscape. Certainly, Australia, when it was occupied by the British, was a cultural landscape and First Nations to this day in many regions of Australia play a vital role in patch burning the landscape, which is crucial for sustaining a lot of the the flora and the fauna and does reduce the risk, particularly in northern and central Australia, of large-scale fires. But there are also parts of Australia that naturally uh, were either protected from burning by First Nations or never burnt. So rainforest areas, for example, 
the alpine peaks, uh, the, the alpine grasslands and woodlands are another example. And we're seeing those burn this time. A number of uh, climate sceptics are trying to divert attention from climate change by arguing that there hasn't been enough fuel reduction burning. This is a really fraught issue. It's getting harder and harder to get the right conditions and to have the right resources available to do control burning. That's something that the upcoming round of government inquiries might begin to address. You know, do we have to start paying more people to be landscape managers? Is this an opportunity, for example, for Australian society to better fund Indigenous ranger programs, the First Nation land management organisations, to do more of this landscape management? Beyond managing fire loads, what are some courses of action that could help mitigate fire risk or at least its impact on people in the environment? My colleagues here at ANU uh, do a lot of research in this area, and they argue that the, the risk of damage depends on this chain of action. So the first question is, can you control the ignition points? Another is to control the spread by controlling the fuel loads. In the severe uh, fire conditions that we've seen in southeastern Australia this summer, actually, it doesn't really matter how much fuel there is on the ground. Those fires are so hot that the fuel loads actually don't make a lot of difference. Mm. Then the next question is the landscaped area around uh, houses and other infrastructure. Certainly, managing that can reduce the risk to infrastructure and to people. And then the actual house itself or the infrastructure, strict building regulations requiring the use of fire resistant materials have only really been introduced into Australia in recent decades. And so there's this huge number of houses and other infrastructure that are very hard to defend. What I would say is that in this fire season, the loss of life and injuries are probably far lower than they have been in previous decades in severe fires. And that's because the severe fires in Victoria in 2009, where many, many more people died, resulted in a change of policy. Since 2009, a new fire danger rating of catastrophic has been put in place by all the state and federal governments, and people are being asked to evacuate fire-prone regions at least the day before severe conditions. Mm -hmm. People are being encouraged to evacuate more than stay. And I think that that's greatly reduced the loss of life this time mm -hmm. around. It does put people, I mean, some people, for example, who live on properties and they have animals, it does put them in very difficult, in a very difficult situation. And I know, for example, my aunt and uncle live just outside of Canberra in a small town called Michelago, which was threatened by fires a couple of weeks or only a week ago. It was very stressful for them. And they have somewhere in the vicinity of 50 alpacas. And so to make the decision to leave can be a very difficult one. They were obviously, you know, really cognizant of the fact that if they had to get out, they would get out and they put their alpacas in special paddocks where they were more likely to be safe. But but it's it's a difficult decision to make um, when it's not just you and your partner and children who you have to evacuate, but you might have dozens or hundreds of animals that you're leaving behind as well. And often when people evacuate in these situations, they may not be able to return for days or weeks afterwards. Yes. I mean, it might, I'll even, let me just read something that my aunt sent while this was happening. She was keeping me updated because we were obviously very concerned about her and my uncle. So she said here, yesterday afternoon turned very nasty with strong winds blowing from the south. The fire spotted along Baruna Road, then Lawler Road and became fierce. Collington Brigade was onto it quickly. Our friend in Lawler Road lost outbuildings, trees, a water tank, but the house was saved. Tony, that's another neighbour, could see it travelling toward their home. I mean, you can imagine how terrifying that would be. Thankfully, our brigade was there. The community mobilised and made sure everyone in the fire's potential tract was contacted. We quickly moved our animals to a northern paddock, put on our yellows and got everything ready. Ruth, that's my cousin, their daughter, came to our aid too. The wind was unbelievable. The brigade contained the fire and it moved along the riverbed on the western edge. Ruth and I, 
my cousin, went and helped at the fire shed. I can't tell you how amazing this community has been. This has to change how we live in this country. The constant stress of what might happen is unbearable and every summer is likely to be like this. We need to be so much better prepared across Australia. Wow. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. I mean, it really hits home on a number of different challenges that your family in particular has faced. And I think also it's a reminder that, you know, it's really great that many more lives were spared in these fires, but that wasn't the case for animals. Uh, Yeah, well, a professor at the University of Sydney conservatively estimated that in New South Wales alone, so southeastern Australia, approximately a billion animals were lost and that didn't count things like frogs or insects or other invertebrates. Now Kangaroo Island, which is an island south of southern Australia, they lost two people tragically and I read that they lost as well approximately 25,000 koalas, which is a species that's already uh, listed. Most of its populations are already listed in Australia as being vulnerable or worse. So yesterday, the Federal Environment Minister has released a preliminary list of animals requiring urgent management intervention. So only animals at this stage, which based on advice from uh, independent scientific advisors, there are 113 species that so far have been identified as the highest priorities because they've had at least 30% of their range burnt. And so just to give you an idea of the kinds of animals we're talking about, 13 bird species, 19 mammal species, 20 reptiles, 17 frog species, five invertebrates, which is probably a gross underestimate given limited knowledge, 20 uh, spiny crayfish species, and 17 freshwater fish species at certainly increased threat, if not at risk of extinction following these fires. What I think is interesting about that list is how so many of those species are freshwater species, the frogs, crustaceans and fish, but also many of the other animals listed here depend substantially for their habitat on those moist riverside, streamside forests for their habitat. And so these fires might sound like a concern of the terrestrial environment, but they're a a real and present danger to freshwater ecology too. I think as well it's important to point out that Australia is a continent with a high level of endemism, which essentially means that we are custodians of entirely unique species, many of which prior to the bushfires were already listed as vulnerable, threatened or even endangered. And as Jamie has explained, that has been exacerbated by these recent fires. Yeah, I was going to ask if we knew the percentage of endemics that were in there. I figured it was pretty high. Well, looking through this list, I would say that virtually every one of these 113 animal species is endemic to Australia. We've been talking a lot about bushfires, and understandably, that's getting most of the coverage, you know, at least for us overseas. But I just wanted to give you both a a second to say if there are other pressing climate challenges that you're currently facing that perhaps are not getting the attention they deserve that we really need to be paying attention to. I'm a little fearful that the response to the fires has been, is being pursued in a way that's disconnected from the broader questions of water management. And so Mm. Mm. the drought and problems with water governance are a sort of slow onset climate change impact, whereas the fire is a fast onset impact exacerbated by climate change. And I am worried that society and our governments are not drawing the the links between them. Mm. Having said that, I think that this is an important policy reform window in Australia, an opportunity to hit the reset button uh, in a number of respects. On the one hand, The climate change sceptics among some of our politicians are running rampant. On the other hand, this is the opportunity to increase funding for conservation of threatened biodiversity. And so for the first time in some decades, we're seeing significant tens of millions of Australian dollars being allocated to conservation. And I'm hopeful that there'll be more announcements from the federal government soon. 
Secondly, we're seeing the debate start again over subsidiarity in terms of community management of their local environment. So a lot of our, our community management organisations have been progressively defunded over the past decade. So these are some of our state-based catchment management authorities, natural resource management groups, grants for community uh, so-called land care organisations, community volunteer organisations. Uh, now I think there's an opportunity for those of us interested in uh, better adaptation to argue for society to better resource these organisations, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to have a better capacity to mm -hmm. undertake the proactive adaptation measures, the things like re-establishing riparian forests, things like managing fuel loads, but also to have that surge capacity there for dealing with disasters. So I would say that as tragic as these fires are, our response to the fires is an opportunity to increase conservation of freshwater ecosystems. Communities around Australia are, are looking to see how to respond. And a lot of the most practical things that can be done are along our rivers and streams. So those include things like revegetating the riverbanks. Our governments and communities are stepping up in terms of uh, programs to control uh, feral predators and herbivores that have been uh, depleting our indigenous flora and fauna. Because these river systems are often the, the focus of human settlement, they are often an opportunity to, to mobilise people to do good things uh, for restoration of our rivers and streams. Yeah, it can be a kind of galvanising moment to bring people together. Then along the same lines, since climate change is at the forefront of people's minds in Australia right now, do you see this as a time for tangible changes in terms of policies relating to fossil fuels and climate change mitigation? So it's probably worth providing our international listeners with some political and policy context. In Australia, there's a handful of lobby groups which have a disproportionate amount of influence over state and federal government policy and arguably at the apex of those groups sits the minerals or the mining lobby and a subset of that is the fossil fuel lobby. Over the last decade or so, a number of prime ministers have been toppled from power because they attempted to introduce climate change policies at the federal level. They were toppled from power as a direct consequence of the influence of the minerals slash fossil fuel lobby. So we find ourselves at a point where it's 2020 and we still do not have any meaningful national policy or law to reduce Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. What we really need is a Prime Minister who is prepared to have vision, courage and show real leadership in relation to this issue. In the meantime, that policy lacuna has to a certain extent attempted to be filled by our state and local governments. For example, some state governments have committed to much more ambition, ambitious greenhouse gas reduction targets and they are actively encouraging investment in renewable energy, which is increasing apace and that's very encouraging to see. Notwithstanding that, the policy landscape is still, it's very incoherent because at that state level and at the federal level, you still have governments who are pumping hundreds of millions and in total billions of dollars of subsidies into the fossil fuel industry. So as I said, it's very encouraging to see investment in renewables increasing dramatically year after year. I think as well it's worth pointing out that recent surveys have shown that somewhere in the vicinity of two-thirds of Australians believe, in inverted commas, in Climate change now, belief is a very strange word to employ because it's a word we use in relation to something for which there's no verifiable evidence. And of course, there is strong evidence that climate change is happening and it's being caused by human activity. So perhaps we should say that roughly two thirds of Australians are prepared to accept the science on climate change. However, in what is really just a massive failure of democracy, we don't have federal government action or policy that reflects those concerns. Will that change anytime soon? Well, hopefully, hopefully there's some momentum that's been built as a consequence of these tragic fires and we will see some developments at the federal level. It really echoes a lot of the situation that I see here in the US too, that 
Unfortunately, there might be a kind of a vacuum in, in leadership at the top or incongruous policies that don't really lead to any positive change on our part. So we're increasingly putting our uh, our hopes and attention towards groups like cities and in the private sector and NGOs and things like that to, to really take on the mantle of, of climate leadership. I do see some positives in that as our federal government remains gridlocked on serious action, other sectors of society are stepping up. Yep. And this summer of uh, fire, ice and pestilence has seen, for example, retired emergency service agency heads from state and federal governments banding together and coming out publicly and saying, this is climate change and here are some of the policies that we had been advising from within government that now need to now need to happen. We've also seen, for example, the mayors of rural shires uh, stand up to some of the climate change rural sceptic politicians and say, no, you don't speak for us. We are elected by the local people in these rural areas and we are telling you we are seeing climate change impacts and we expect our political uh, leaders at the state and federal level to act. I also think that the extent to which communities across Australia were forced to act for themselves. I mean, Australia is well set up with volunteer agencies to do this, you know, ranging from sporting clubs like surf lifesaving clubs that became the evacuation centres through to volunteer fire brigades to state emergency service rescue agencies through to land care groups and Indigenous rangers. They all stepped up and I suspect that this will be a cathartic moment where these communities say more than ever we have to work out ways of helping ourselves and that includes challenging state and federal governments to do better. Mm, I'd agree with that. Well, based on that, it seems like maybe we've identified both the barriers to progress and also the pathways towards what we hope could be some positive policy changes on the horizon. We can go ahead and end on that note, too. Thanks to both of you, Jamie and Emma, for all of your insight. Thank you both. Great chat. Talk to you later. Talk to you all later. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. Without a doubt, the recent fires in Australia led to major short-term harm. Prior to the interview, I hadn't put as much thought into the long-term implications on water quality or freshwater ecosystems, though. And as sad as it is to talk about, in having these types of conversations, we ultimately hope to identify the ways in which we can work to prevent these types of tragedies from recurring through policy, management, and even behavioral changes. Yeah, I mean, we said it in the interview, too. But the silver lining of the bushfires has got to be in the increased public awareness, the dialogue, and calls for strong action on climate change and reducing our dependence on fossil fuels. There's a really unique window of opportunity for action. However, the challenge is often in sustaining the calls for change when it seems like, you know, day to day we're lurching from one crisis to another. Governance can be a slow moving process and time is not really on our side. But thankfully, even if national policies are slow or difficult to change, it sounds like a lot of local government, civil society, and indigenous groups are making an impact and are keeping up the pressure on the ground in Australia. For those who want to donate to the relief efforts for the recent bushfires, Emma and Jamie provided several recommendations where your contributions can have a meaningful impact. WWF Australia, Aussie Ark Turtle Conservancy, the Country Women's Association, and the Foundation for Rural and Regional Renewal. We've posted links to those organizations in the episode description. That's a wrap for this episode of Climate Ready. Thanks to you, listeners, for taking time out of your busy day to join us. And a big thanks to our interview guests, Dr. Jamie Piddock and Dr. Emma Carmody. From all of us at Climate Ready, we remind you all to be good to each other in these uncertain times and listen to the advice of the medical community. We'll get through this. Until next time, everyone. Climate Ready Podcast is produced by John Matthews of the Alliance for Global Water Adaptation. It is directed and edited by Alex Maroner and Ingrid Timbo.